Uh, I think they got everything out of the way, so let's pray and we'll begin. Father, um, oh Lord, there's, <laughs> there's a lot going on, Lord, this week, and uh, I do ask that you'd be with Marco and Hun, Lord, his wife, that they're going to have little Noah, uh, possibly today or in the next few days, and uh, I know that they're anticipating uh, the birth. I pray that everything goes well for that birth, and uh, Lord, that you would just comfort uh, and, and just bring your peace at that time, Lord. May it just be such a joy, Father, when little Noah comes into this world. And uh, also ask that you'd be with those who are sick today, Lord. We've got quite a few, um, Jacob and James, and, and uh, I know some of my family members, Lord, have been wanting to come here, and they weren't able to come. And uh, Kyle and Eli are out with family. I pray you give grant them just an opportunity to reach out to their family. And, uh, and just to bless them, Lord, at this time. And I uh, just thank you for what you're doing today, Lord, in this service. We ask that you would speak to us, uh, Lord, that we wouldn't just come to church to uh, see a performance, Lord, to see a comedy show, uh, but rather, Lord, we would just get into your word and, and get to know who you are. And uh, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So, all right. By the way, way of reminder. I love it when we come to church. Uh, a lot of you guys are, are mature in your walk with the Lord, which is really, really good. Uh, but maybe just a reminder, when we come to church, let's, it's good to just get into the Word of God. Doesn't that make sense? Like, what, why would you go to church? You obviously want to learn about the Lord, right? And there's a lot of churches that you come to church and they don't even open up their Bibles. They, they talk about stories, they talk about this and that, and they go off into different worlds where you're like, wow, that was cool, but I could have seen that on a commercial on TV. <laughs> I could have got all that other stuff on, on watching TV and staying at home. So it's good when we come together as the body of Christ and we learn uh, from the Lord and what the Lord wants to speak to us on uh, corporately is very biblical. So, 1 Peter chapter 5, instead of taking out the whole chapter, um, we go chapter by chapter, verse by verse, book by book, uh, here at our group, and that's why uh, I decided that we're just going to go through the first four verses today. You guys like that? I'm going to give you guys a little break, because last time you guys went through like 50 verses. <laughs> so, uh, we're going to go through the first four verses, and we're going to talk about uh, really the shepherds of the church, the the pastors of the, sh the church. And so I figure I'm going to actually change up the way we do things on Sundays. This Sunday, I do like a little meeting kind of a thing. and let you guys just know uh, what my role is as a pastor. Uh, sometimes we come to church and we look at the pastors and sometimes we can escalate them to a, a standard that they're really not supposed to be in. And, and then they can take advantage of that position and they can uh, be leg legalistic over the church. Uh, in other words, pastors really shouldn't know necessarily like your, your paycheck, you know, or they shouldn't tell you, you need to pay your tithes, or there's certain things that pastors do that just, you know, we, we kind of go with the flow, but we don't realize it's really not biblical. There's a right way to do things according to the word, and there's a other way to do things that's not really according to the word. So I want to give you guys a little glance at what uh, a, a, the position of a, a pastor is. And, and that's what we find ourselves as we're going verse by verse. We just finished 1 Peter chapter 4 last week. And we learned about five things uh, for our suffering because we're in the faith. Because we became Christians God gave us this joy. God changed up our lives, right? But then he gave us suffering, and we're like, why? <laughs> right? Why do you give me suffering as a Christian? And it's necessary as a Christian for growth, that you would mature and that you would grow in your walk with the Lord. If you are not going through sufferings and trials, you're not going to grow. So we looked at those things last week, and Peter's dealing with the shepherds in these next four verses Really, the overseers, or today we call them pastors, right? Or, or bishops, if you will. But they were, they were suffering persecution back then. The believers were suffering persecution. You guys remember, that's during the time of Nero. Uh, by the way, in uh, 64 AD, Rome, uh, uh, there was a, a fire in Rome, 
And Nero blamed it on the Christians, bless you. He didn't know, we didn't know who actually caused the fire, but it was blamed on Christians at that time. So they began to persecute Christians, and, and, and they're like, you burn down our city, we're going to burn down your body. And they would put them to stakes and chain them up and burn them alive. They did some horrible stuff. You guys can do your own research in history and what actually happened uh, back then to the early Christians of the church. But there was a lot of stuff happening, so Peter recognizes how important it is to address uh, the, the shepherds who are in charge of the flock of God. Now, it sounds, that's terminology, right? That's like the flock of God. Is there like birds in the church? No. Uh, the Bible uh, talks about sheep are a picture of the church. We are a picture of, well, sheep. And sheep, is a, it's a funny thing that God does that because sheep are the dumbest mammals in the world. Do you know that? We'll get through we'll get a few things of what sheep do, but they're, they're dumb. <laughs> I'm like, great, Lord, thanks, thanks. That's the name calling me. You can't sin, but you can call it sheep. And, but he, it's funny, it's like he created sheep just so that he can give us an example of how we actually are uh, in, in ways, and that he can give us examples here in the Word uh, so that we can learn from, which is very interesting. But uh, Peter recognizes these things, and he's going to address uh, really uh, where uh, we're to be grounded in the Word of God as shepherds. If, if you see pastors, or let's say you yourself want to become a pastor, you're like, wow, I, I want to become a pastor. Really? Well, you need to be grounded in the Word of God. you got to know the Word of God. Uh, if you don't even know... Uh, anything that talks about salvation or like big major areas in the Bible that teaches, mm, you got to know those things to be a pastor. Uh, but also, he's going to point out that you need to be mature spiritually, not just physically mature, but spiritually mature. Being able to teach them practically, even in the midst of persecution. And that's what he's going to do to these pastors who are overseeing these people who are going to be persecuted and are being persecuted. And this is an intense thing. Now today, we're not really being persecuted like this. So this is like the intense uh, drama kind of thing that we see here. So the context is really dealing with the church corporately, right? The pastors, as well as the rest of the church. Uh, the body of Christ as whole. So it's important uh, for these pastors to lead the flock of God in a mature way. But uh, think about it. What, what is ministry? Right? You guys come to church and you hear us talk about, Lord, bless the ministry. This is the ministry that God's doing. What is ministry? It's, it's, it's rewarding. It's dirty. There's highs. There's lows. There's a, there's a lot of stuff that entails ministry in the church. But it's not just the pastor who's in charge. You see, if you go out from right here, from this church, and you go just across the street, street to a business or a big corporate business, there's CEOs, there's presidents, there's managers, and there's kind of a system, an organization, if you will, of things that go on. So you work your way up the ladder uh, in this organization in order to get that top dollar, right? Well, in ministry, it's the opposite. <laughs> you work your way to the bottom. <laughs> and that's the goal as a, as a Christian. You want to be a servant. And a servant actually is a leader. See, when you read the Bible, Jesus is like, oh, you want to be first? You got to be last. Jesus begins to wash the disciples' feet to show them that it's not at all about being Mr. Macho, being the greatest of all time, because they were just walking to, to go to that house, and they're like, hey, who's going to be the greatest in the kingdom? I am, no way. And they're arguing with each other. So Jesus go, goes ahead and shows them a demonstration of servanthood. And so the pastor is no different than anybody else in the church. God doesn't look at the pastor. He's like, whoa, it's you. Wow. He looks at all of us like that. He, he's excited to talk to every, each and every one of us. And, and that's the thing that we need to recognize in the church, that we are equal in the church. Now, of course, there's military uh, terms and things like that the Bible gives in 1 Timothy, 2 Timothy. And, of course, there's a chain of command. You know, there's just that authority, but yet we're still men. We make mistakes. We do things on our own. Um, but at the same time, 
The Bible says that Jesus shows no partiality. So God's not going to come to me and be like, oh, Josh, it's you. Hey, I got this brand new house for you. And then you walk over and God's all, uh, yeah, you need to work yourself a little more. <laughs> Nothing like that. That's not biblical at all. Because the God of the Bible is a God of grace. And he shows grace over and over. In fact, those who are blessed become more humble in the Bible. The more blessed you get, the more you're like, oh, why, why me? Why are you doing this? I don't deserve this. And that's the attitude. And that's why God's blessing that person. It's because they're humble. The Bible says the, the, uh, the meek shall inherit the earth. The Bible says a lot, actually, about people who are humble, God is going to exalt. God is going to promote. But not so that they can receive glory, but they're humble so that they're protected from being prideful and receiving glory to themselves. You guys get what I'm saying? Sometimes... Uh, when people are clapping and plotting for like the pastor to get up, which I'm glad you guys don't do, uh, sometimes pastors are like, oh, thank you, thank you, thank you very much, I'm going to bow because of who I am, right? That's wrong. <laughs> That's getting the credit for what the Lord has done. Uh, the, we shouldn't get credit at all. So from media ministry, all the way from the ushers, the deacons, the, uh, the, the people who are doing maintenance and cleaning up the place, by the way, that's all of us we should be doing. Um, we're all equal in God's eyes. All of our positions are great positions. None of them are least. So we got that out of the way? Are we good? We got, that kind of sounds confusing, right? Because you go to the, the world, they have a system working the ladder. In the church, there's no ladder. <laughs> We're all equal in God's eyes. There is no like, oh, pastor, oh, how are you? <laughs> None of that. Don't do that to me, by the way. I'll be like, what are you doing? <laughs> I'm out of here, you weirdo. Um, but practically, all of us are leaders in one way or another. Uh, moms, right, like my wife, she's, she's a leader over my daughter. She's in, ch in charge of uh, caring for her, like my daughter, right? And also, I'm sorry, I didn't sleep last night, by the way. I went to Starbucks to give me all this coffee, and I was up all night. So if I, like, start murmuring and mumbling, that's why. All right, so, okay. Whew. Okay, uh, I also am a, a, a leader, right? And my family, you guys are leaders of your families. You're all leading in some way, in some aspect, whether it's at work, whether it's with family, whether you have younger brothers or sisters that are looking up to you, whether you have friends who need advice. Someone is looking to you in some way, and you're leading them in some way. Um, so it's very interesting. So all of us can glean from this teaching. Now, this teaching is directly, the Bible is talking context, to pastors, to shepherds. And I'm going to give you guys some biblical view of who these shepherds are and who these pastors are. And, and, uh, and it kind of confuses you. If you guys are used to doing um, studying, like, uh, like I've studied uh, Reformation uh, of the church, I've studied the uh, Calvinist movement, I've studied the uh, non denominational movements, and the, all these movements, and how they, there's books and books and books like crazy. And they talk about, oh, this is how a pastor ought to be, this is how a deacon is, ought to be, this is a bishop, this is a. You guys get where I'm going? You go to church and you're like, what are all these names anyway? It's like you're playing chess. Like, who's the pawn and who's the king? You know, like, what's really going on? And so you get kind of confused if you read all that stuff. So it's good to just get rid of all that stuff and just get what the Bible says. You guys with me on that? Makes sense, right? Keep it simple. Keep it to the Word of God. If I come to church, I just want to hear the Word of God. I don't want you to pull out all these other books and be like, John MacArthur says, right? I want to hear the Bible says. I don't want to get excited about the Word. I don't want to be all like, wow, Obama says what? You know, like I want to say... The Word of God says it, not, not any man uh, at all. So, first of all, before we begin, I want to let you guys know that there's some unrealistic expectations in ministry, and often the pastor can have like a huge load of 
unrealistic duties uh, that are happening or, or expectations that the, the, the church has for the pastor. And also the church can have a, an array of expectations that nobody can live up to. And so there's there's got to be uh, understanding that there's some unrealistic things that are not always going to happen in the church. Uh, but I think that there needs to be a clear understanding, a realism, really, of what is happening in the church. So not every church is going to experience phenomenal growth. It's not going to be like a, a mega church all of a sudden. That's they, When you read the Bible, God actually, in the book of Acts, got churches in houses. And their houses in Jerusalem are very, very small. So it's, God wasn't like, uh, excuse me, you must be in sin, guys, because there's only like five people in your church. And they're like, oh, no. <laughs> no. It was actually a good thing. God's like, yeah, that's the church. And he, he, he put them all there. And that was a wonderful thing. And today it's like, we're blessed. Like, we have... Like our church here is a bless. Like we're getting we're getting big, but it's it's a big facility, but we're still a small church, right? Like especially our group, we're like, woo, praise the Lord. I'm actually excited about small group. Uh, but uh, whatever the Lord wants to do, but we gotta understand we shouldn't have those goals of having a big church. Because nowhere in the Bible is it saying you know, having a big church. Your goal should have God's will done, right? If God wants you to be a small church, Praise the Lord. If God wants you to be a big church, God, give me grace, right? It's, it's got to be coming from Him. He needs to give us the strength. But both the pastor and the congregation need to banish from their minds the expectations of a mega church or even being popular. I think that's the big thing uh, for, for me going to Bible college. And uh, all of my friends, by the way, are like, they're all pastors and missionaries and, and they're super popular. Like, I go to their Facebooks. Or their Twitters, right, are following them. And I'm like, man, these guys have like 10 billion friends. <laughs> what is, these guys are crazy. And there's, they got like these huge churches already. And I was like, man, it's been like three years. How did they do that? And it's, so there's that, there's that movement going on now where, where sometimes you can look at others and be like, I want to be popular, right? And you, you get that sometimes and you can't have that. That's totally in the flesh which is you and not God. If the church is going to be doing anything, God's going to use leaders in the church, but these leaders need to get their direction from God alone. They can't say, hey God, i got a better idea than you. This is my method. Check this out. God's like, oh, that is good. No, that's not the Lord. God gives the direction, and God already gave that direction years ago. The Bible says that God's word is the same yesterday, today, and forever. So what God has said 2,000 years ago is just as true today. And 10 billion years ago, uh, in the future, ago, 10 billion years in the future, God's truth in the word of God will never fade away. It will never be like, oh yeah, that was old school stuff, though. That's, that's not true anymore. No such thing. So using your logic mind, using your brain, we're going to go through Scripture and understand that God set these things in order for you and I today. Um, and understand that a pastor needs to be tolerant of people he is serving. Uh, if, if, if you're going to be a pastor, the flock is to be tolerant of the pastor. Recognize that the pastor makes mistakes. Okay, I recognize that a lot of you guys make mistakes, right? Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We already know that. Nobody's perfect. We all miss the target, right? We're like, where's that arrow going? <laughs> the target's over there. <laughs> what happened? We all miss the target of perfection. We are not perfect people. I'm not perfect people, <laughs> right? You recognize you're not perfect, recognize I'm not perfect, and we got to work together, tolerate each other, that when we make mistakes, we got to come alongside each other and aid one another. I love being married because when my wife is doing something, like going in another world, I'm able to come alongside her, right, and get my, like, CPR bag out, right, get all band-aids ready, spiritually speaking, and come alongside her and be like, hey, what's going on? And we can work things out and I can, in a sense, repair her and the things that she's going through. Now, when I start to go, woo, on my own little world, she could come alongside and be like, hey, wake up. You need to pray again, Lord to God. I'm like, oh, that's true. Oh, what am I doing? And uh, she's able to put me back in check in that sense. So it's really cool being married. We got that line of accountability. But we as a church are... God kind of gives a, a, an analogy of marriage between 
God and the church. The church is almost like a picture of the bridegroom, and he's being the groom, and, and we, it's kind of like a marriage with the same thing. So when we are failing, God comes to our aid. And you as the church, I as the church, right? When I fail, you need to come to my aid as well. Don't be quick to be like, out of here. You know what I'm saying? If, if I do that to you and you're like, oh, I just tripped and hit my knee. I'm all, you fell down. You're not perfect. Get out of our church. <laughs> that would be wrong, right? There, there's a biblical way of doing things, but that also applies to you as well. And so many times there's people who just, once pastor does one thing wrong, they're gone, right? They're just wiped out of the, the planet Earth. They're, they're out of existence. And so you need to have that grace as well. Now, long-term and effective ministry is always disappointing. There's going to be dips of disappointment, and there's going to be turns that you take that are unexpected uh, things that happen in the church as pastors. And so there's imperfect shepherds leading imperfect sheep in service of a perfect God who has a perfect plan. And it just works out because God is in charge of everything. So, you guys ready to begin? That was kind of intro, my bad. There's a lot of stuff there. Um, we're gonna go through five things today uh, that Peter outlines in our text for us. Now these five things are found in uh, the first four verses. So uh, let's go to start in verse one and speaking about who Peter exhorts. That's the first thing we're gonna look at is who Peter exhorts, and that is the elders. Look at verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 5. It says, The elders who are among you I exhort, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ, and also a partaker of the glory that will, will be revealed. Now Peter is saying, hey, I am a fellow elder of you guys as well. He's saying, I exhort, the word exhort is para, which means to come alongside, which the Holy Spirit does as well, right? The, the par, parakletos, the whatever, you guys don't know Greek, I don't know, I'm speaking Greek. Anyways, um, he comes alongside us, the kaleo, to call. Uh, so Peter was called to come alongside uh, the elders of the church, the leaders of the body of Christ, and, and, and let's step back, actually. Let's get kind of a, a, a bird's eye view of what's going on here in the church government, the church leadership, if you will. Um, I think a lot of churches today don't even understand what the Bible actually teaches on uh, church leadership. I think uh, a lot of pastors neglect passages like this so that they can stay in authority and they can stay in, uh, in, in a position of telling and bossing you around kind of a thing, like like worldly businesses do. You see, in the church, pastors not to do that. If your pastor comes up to you and says, you need to come to church today, tomorrow, that day, this day, you need to. I don't care, you need to erase your schedule on the other things you're doing, and you got to come. And I understand what he's saying, but, but because it's biblical that you should not neglect, right, the fellowship of believers, but... There's that, there's that legalism that you got to be very careful and you can't command people to do anything. You see, there's a book called Purpose Driven Life, right? Um, some guy writes it. I forget the guy's name. Yes. That guy. Um, but it Purpose Driven, see, that kept me from actually reading the book. I, I saw the title, Purpose Driven Life, and I was like, wow, that is not biblical. <laughs> Uh, it's amazing. And, and because I say this, why? Because we are not purpose driven. God, God doesn't drive us. Do you guys know what driving is? It's, it's like those uh, Eskimo guys that have a whole bunch of like dogs. Sorry, my brain's not working. It's like a whole bunch of dogs and they're like, they're like whipping them or whatever, keeping, they're driving them and they're behind the sheep or the, the sheep or the, or the dogs or you think of like horses, right? They're like whipping them, they're like whoosh, whoosh, whoosh. That's driving them. And, and God doesn't drive us. God's not like, get on track, go to church, go do this, do that. No, God doesn't do that. You're free in the Lord. One of the things that I've noticed in church that pastors do is that they, and then that the, the, on biblical, by the way, is that they'll push the church and say, uh, without you, the church wouldn't be here. Or without you and your, your uh, tithing to the church, uh, we couldn't have a church together. 
And, and that's not biblical. If God wants to put the church together, he'll do it. He doesn't need your money. You guys with me on that? Like, come on now. We pay out of worship and act of worship to the Lord. And so we shouldn't be talking about, like, money, you know, every single Sunday. Uh, by the way, if you're new here, we don't talk about, like, money and tithes and offerings and all that every time. Um, but uh, that's one of those areas that I notice that pastors do. And it's like, it's like they're driving the church to do something that they're commanded to do. Now, you're not commanded to worship the Lord. You get to worship the Lord. You with me on that? You, you're not, you don't have to. You get to. Now, if you have to do something, that's why I, growing up, I hated house chores. My mom's all, you have to do this, this, and that. And my older brothers will come, they'll be like, I'll beat you up unless you do my chores too. And they'll be like, ah, I hate life, right? I have to do this. And, and uh, so I was cleaning and like just bummed out, like, oh, I hate this, uh, complaining. Now, if you have to come to church, you're going to come to church like this. Oh, I hate coming to church. But if you have a relationship with the Lord, and you're like, Lord, oh, I just want to seek out your word. I want to hear from you so that when I pray to you, I hear what you're answering me in my prayers. And there's just that communication going on. Man, I can't wait to go to church. I just, ah, oh, I, I want to go to church. That's more of the attitude. You get to go to church. Now, when you get to do something freely out of your own, grace changes everything. Now, if you're driven by your parents, right? Some of you guys can agree with me on this. Some of your parents are like, you go to church right now. You're like, ah. You go to church and you're like, I hate church. <laughs> right? That's pretty much it. But if you get to go, if your parents say, you can go if you want to. It's up to you. And you choose to go, then it just it changes your attitude on things. Now you're like, wow, I get to come to church. This is pretty awesome. It's just a whole other reality. So it's really, really cool. So Peter is exhorting the, the church elders, hey, guys, be, you guys who are in control, uh, he even says in Ephesians chapter 4, verse 11, and put it up here, it says, uh, and he himself, speaking of God, gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, and some pastor teachers for the equipping of the saints for the work of ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. That's the purpose of uh, why God put these four positions in the church. Now, there are four offices in the church leadership. Note the word some. It is not before the word teacher. It's some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. Um, oh, actually, I put that there, some. But uh, it's not really there for the word teacher. Uh, so we believe the pastor is a teacher, pastor teacher, not pastor and some teacher. You guys with me on that? Um, and so it really has one office. A pastor is a teacher at the same time. So others disagree with that view. And they say that there are actually five offices in church leadership. And, and the teacher are, is a separate office. And I understand the thought of that because some pastors cannot teach at all. They get up there and you're like... They're like, hi, everybody, we're going to read the Bible. Amen. <laughs> oh, are you going to teach us anything? And so there's a difference there with all of that. And, uh, and I've, I've also seen teachers that are not really good pastors. So I can see what people are saying there, and all of that works out. But uh, grammatically speaking, there are four offices. There's the apostle, the prophet, the evangelist, and the pastor teacher that I put together because the Bible doesn't say some. It puts them together whenever it talks about pastor teacher. So there are three separate people that hold these four offices. One of them is one uh, in, in 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1 that we just read. It's the word elder, and that's presbyterial. So that's where we get the word Presbyterian, by the way, from elder. And elder there is a uh, mature, uh, spiritually speaking, older adult. So if you go to an adult and an adult's not uh, mature, spiritually, they're not necessarily an elder, right? Physically, they're an elder to us, right? Traditionally, I go up to my grandparents and I, I look at them as elders, right? Because they're older. But the Bible is talking about positionally in the church, those who hold the office of an elder need to be spiritually mature, not just because they're old, right? Acts chapter 20, uh, when Paul was gathered together with the mature elders, uh, it was talking about the spiritually mature. So uh, going on, the bishop, 
the bishop is, well, the second person mentioned in light of these three offices. 1 Timothy 3, 1 through 7 talks about it. You guys can look it up on your own. Um, but Paul gives an outline to this position of a bishop. Now, a bishop is episcopal, which I don't even know why I keep giving you guys the, the never mind. But it's, it's Episcopal, or Episcopalians is where they get the word from. And so uh, they get their word from this word bishop. So this word simply means an overseer, an inspector, or one who watches over, or one who oversees the well-being of the church. We often refer to them as pastors. So when you guys hear the word bishop, it, 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 it interchangeably kind of goes together uh, as a pastor. So elder is who they are spiritually mature, right? Uh, a bishop speaks of what they do. They're an overseer. So giving you guys a quick little grammar. So when we go through stuff, verses in the future, you guys just have a quick understanding of what that means. Both of these words, both uh, bishop and elder, they're both used interchangeably, kind of together. So look at 1 Peter chapter uh, 5, verse 2. It says, Shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly, the Bible says in verse 2. Um, so as overseers, it's the same word for bishops. So elders... Uh, elder, bishop, overseer, we say today, pastor, the same thing. Oftentimes, it's just used together. We, we, we mix those words together. They can be referred to sometimes as the same names. And they oversee really the spiritual needs of the church. Now, there's the deacon, and that's the third position or office, if you will, that we're talking about today uh, regarding the offices. Now, the deacons are different. Uh, means diakonos, or uh, means waiter or servant. Uh, found in First Timothy three, chapter eight, talks about the qualifications of the deacon. Actually, we call him usher, servant, waiter. Uh, cares for the physical needs of the body of Christ. And, and notice the elder bishop, pastor, right? Cares for the spiritual needs of the church, but the deacon cares for the physical needs of the church. So when there's, you know, food things, you know, people need food or they need their bills paid or they need uh, help moving out of their house, usually the deacons of the church kind of jump on the opportunity uh, to go and do that. But women are actually labeled in the Bible to come alongside this title. Now, there is no women pastors in the Bible. There is no women elders in the Bible. No women bishops in the Bible. No women, you guys with me on that? And I, I don't mean to be like, ah, no women. But there is women deacons in the Bible, which is really cool. So they come alongside the church, and, and that's why you see like women, like ushers, if you will, they're greeting people at the door, they're handing out bulletins. That's totally okay, because that's biblical. You can't come into church and be like, no, a woman's not going to help me with anything, right? That's, no, biblically, a woman actually, it's like a deaconist, I guess you could call it, right? It would be right terminology. Um, so that's very interesting. And by the way, Jesus shows this example of a deacon in John chapter 13 when he goes to the disciples and begins to wash their feet. He's showing them how to be a servant. And that servant is the same thing as a pastor. A pastor ought to do the same thing. A deacon ought to do the same thing. Uh, those who are overseeing the, the needs of the church. Now, I said there was five things that we were going to overlook. Now, the second thing we're going to look at is why. Why can Peter exhort these shepherds, uh, pastors, if you will? He, he gives us three reasons in verse 1 again. Going back to verse 1, um, Peter, according to Galatians chapter 2, verse 9, he says, uh, one, he's one of the pillars of the church, by the way, and one of the, the go-to guys. And yet, with Peter... He didn't think himself over the church. He didn't think himself like, man, God, God calls me the rock of the church. Right? God is good. I'm the founder. He didn't think of any of that stuff, right? He was like, he was one of the elders. He labels himself in verse 1. He doesn't say, I'm the elder, by the way. I'm the first guy that God's going to use in the church. So back up, everybody, and let me show you what's up. You know, no. None of that. In fact, he labels himself equally in verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 5. Uh, or, I'm sorry, yes, 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 1. And um, 
Secondly, I said those three reasons in verse 1 that, uh, that we see why Peter can exhort these shepherds. And second reason would be Peter is a witness of the sufferings of Christ. If you look at verse 1 again, he says, I who am a fellow elder and a witness of the sufferings of Christ. Now the word witness is actually martyr. See, he didn't just witness visually, but he is being a witness, a martyr. He's dying for the sake of the cross. He's dying for the sake of Christ throughout his life. He's going to give his life at the end of his life physically, but daily he is dying to himself. And see, Peter was one of those guys who followed Jesus for three years. Man, he was there in, in the garden. He was there uh, at the cross. He was there uh, over and over. He was there, right? He ran to the tomb. Uh, he was there. He's seen. He witnessed things with his own eyes. He knew about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Now, thirdly, I said those three reasons why Peter can exhort these shepherds who are about to get persecuted, by the way. Um, third reason is Peter was a partaker of the glory that was yet to be revealed at the end of verse 1. So Peter understood he would see Jesus one day face to face. He knew that, hey, we're going to see the Lord. All this is temporal. Don't worry about it. Peter can exhort them because he had an intimate relationship with the Lord. He knew who the Lord was, and because he knows who the Lord is, he's able now to encourage others who know the Lord as well and come alongside them. Now, if Peter didn't know the Lord, he couldn't encourage anybody in the church. He could come alongside. And by the way, um, I get I get emails or, or uh, people will come to the church and be like, hey, we want to help you strategize to become a good church and a perfect church. Here's some programs that you can do. Here's some things that you can do in the church. And we're just the business. And you just give us $5,000. And we'll help put all this thing stuff together. And, and you will grow your church. And I was like, wow, good job on that. Like, uh, Good luck on that, by the way. But not here. We're the church of God. We're not a church organization. We don't go according to man's plans. We go according to God's calling. And we wait on the Lord because we know the Lord. We don't need to go and do our own thing. You guys with me on that? If you come to church and it's all about programs, that's all it's going to be about the rest of your life. When you get to heaven, you're like, where's the programs? Where's the activities? <laughs> and God's like, hey, it's about a relationship with me. And you're like, oh, I missed the whole picture. <laughs> Who was my pastor back then? Man, and it's his fault. He didn't teach us this stuff. So um, bear with me on this, right? It's all about a relationship. And you'll definitely understand uh, for sure, for sure, when you get to heaven, you're like, oh, Man, it's not about what I do, it's about what he did on the cross that allows me to do, right, and be who I am for all eternity. It's about him who gave me that grace and that entrance uh, to come before his throne. So, uh, uh, before, uh, yeah, before you can even be ministered to, by the way, uh, as far as a, let me slow down a little bit. Uh, for a pastor, let's say my position, right? Before I can get up here and, and even talk to you guys about anything, i got to seek the Lord. I can't just study the Bible and be like, okay, and pull together a study, and that's good, and that's great. I'll come up here and I'll talk. None of you guys get any kind of ministering from the Lord because I didn't get ministered to by the Lord. I may have got a study, but I didn't get ministered to from the Lord. So if, unless I take the time and sacrifice my time from all the things that I could be doing, and I sacrifice that time to prayer and seeking the Lord and actually waiting on the Lord, and, all, and it's funny because God's like, I'm like, hey, Lord, man, speak to me on this passage. I read it over and over and over and over. And I'm like, Lord, I know what it's saying, but what are you saying? And then finally God's like, boom, here it all is. So it's, it's, it just comes like you're like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa, it does say that. It's all there. I just never saw it before. And it just, the Lord ministers to my heart. Now I'm able to get up here and to minister to you. And that's why sometimes you guys can walk away and be like, wow, totally convicted about this area. Or totally blessed about this. Or you guys get what I'm saying? God is able to minister to you. So pray for your pastors, right? That that I would, especially, I would know who the Lord is. And, and seek out God's word and seek God's voice and really hear from the Lord. Because if I'm not hearing from the Lord, really, we're, we're a joke. You guys with me on that? We're just coming together and we're just playing church. Like little kids playing house. We're playing church. We're coming together. We're fake, right? Just like a whole lot of other churches. But we want to be real and we want to be diligent to what God has to give to us. So it's not doing the right thing for the sake of the right thing. It's 
that it needs to flow through Jesus Christ. It needs to come from the Lord. And, and, and the same thing, parents with your kids, it's got to be flowing. The Lord's got to flow through your life in order to get to the kids. Otherwise, the kids are going to grow up and they're going to be little rebels and they're going to go their own way. But unless you're being ministered to, and that's one thing to drive your kids, right? You guys with me on the word drive? Uh, it's one thing to drive them to be like, you go to church, you read your Bible, you pray, and you're like, ah. But if, if the Lord's not ministering through the parents, then the kids aren't going to feel that. They're not going to see it. They're not going to hear it. Hear it. <laughs> hear it. <laughs> wow. That was interesting. Anyways, um, so I said the first thing is who Peter exhorts. Second thing is why Peter can exhort these shepherd pastors. Third thing is what Peter can exhort them to do. Look at verse 2 again. It says, shepherd the flock of God which is among you, serving as overseers, not by compulsion, but willingly. So uh, Peter's going to exhort them, uh, these, these uh, shepherds, and commands them to shepherd the flock of God, and he tells them in two different ways. Number one, by the way, a shepherd, actually, go to with me to John chapter 21. If you guys got your Bibles, go to the left. John chapter 21. I didn't put it up on the PowerPoint. Sorry, guys. <laughs> John chapter 21, verse 15. John 21, 15. It says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? And, and he could be referring to the fish, right, that were right there on the sea after he rose from the grave. Three days later, he meets the disciples and Peter jumped out, came to the Lord first. The other disciples are making their way. And it, it, he has fish right there. And, and, uh, and he could be saying, do you love me more than these fish? Or he could be saying, do you love me more than these disciples that are here, these people around us? And, and, and Peter says to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. And he said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. And he said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, now Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things and you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, notice when, when we say shepherd, it means to feed, to nourish, to tend, to oversee. It goes along the same lines as a bishop. Uh, which means to oversee, kind of the same thing. So shepherds do what? They lead, they protect, and they feed the sheep. And Jesus says three times right here, he's like, feed my sheep, tend the sheep, twice, he says. And so there's actually, uh, to love to preach is one thing, but to love those to whom we preach is quite another thing. It's easy to get up and preach and teach, but unless you love the people that you're teaching to, it's, it's a whole different ballgame. So, uh, there's a Russian proverb that says, without a shepherd, sheep are not a flock. I would agree with that. Um, but notice the words in verse 17, more than these that Jesus says. It could be speaking about the fish, right? We don't know uh, really what he's speaking about, but uh, he's really trying to say, do you love me more than anything and anyone? You can gather from that. And, and you can apply that to your own heart. If Jesus was in this place right now and he says, do you love me more than everything in this world? Do you love me more than everybody in this world? If you don't love the Lord more than everybody else, you are in idolatry. Because idolatry is placing someone or something before God. And unless your love for God is greater, then you're in trouble. <laughs> So, uh, being a shepherd means feeding, nourishing, tending sheep. Why? Because sheep are dumb. Man, sheep cannot defend themselves. They, they cannot take care of themselves. Like, that can, they, they actually, they can be eating grass, and when they're done eating the grass, they'll start eating the dirt. And they don't know when to stop. They'll just, they'll die. They'll see, like, a poison ivy, and they're like, what's that? Ooh. They're actually, animals have a distinct uh, thing that God put in all animals Except sheep. <laughs> All sheep will come up to like poison ivy or something like, oh, that's not good. <laughs> I'm walking over here, right? Sheep, they don't, they don't know the difference. You can put poison right in front of them. You can put a sword right there doing this, and they'll walk up to it and be like, what's that? <laughs> they're dumb. They just, they're dumb. Um, they can't take care of themselves. There's millions of sheep in this world, and every single sheep is being taken care of. Because if they're not being taken care of, they'll die on their own. 
so uh, on their own. Sheep cannot cleanse themselves. They don't just jump in a pool, you know, and just be like, ah, or like, you know, they don't clean themselves like cats and dogs. They they can't clean themselves. So very interesting. Sheep always wander off. They always get lost. No wonder we're told in Isaiah chapter 53, verse 6, all we like sheep have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. And that was also a prophecy of when Jesus was being betrayed in the Garden of Gethsemane, when all the disciples betrayed him. John 6, verse 66, man, they betrayed him back then. They also betrayed him again. Jesus even told Peter, because he's like, I'm all betrayed. I'm not me. I'm the man. And then Jesus is like, dude, you're going to betray me three times tonight before the rooster crows. And Peter's like, wow. And he did. Peter betrayed him three times. And uh, it was a sad thing. So that verse is actually prophecy as well. But we are dumb like sheep. <laughs> we are referred to as sheep as dumb lost sheep uh, before the great shepherd saved us. So we don't like uh, to be sheep, actually. We like to be wolves and tigers and lions, right? We're like, rah. We don't like to be called sheep at all. So in the church, shepherds are to teach sheep corporately. Pastors are to come up, and that's what we're doing here. We're teaching the sheep corporately, uh, and not programs and hype and flashing lights and like, hey, it's all about us. It's not about us. It's simply about the Word of God. And that's why we teach the Word of God verse by verse. It's important that the sheep get nourished in the Word of God spiritually. You see, if you have a church that's not mature spiritually, you got a poor church. I'm not talking financially. I'm talking spiritually. And that's not a church. Uh, it's a weak church. So Satan could come in and be like, you guys, are, I don't even want to come here. You guys are too weak for me. <laughs> it's a matter here. But it, it all comes to the Word of God. And verse 2 is talking about the flock of God among you in chapter 5, verse 2. So it speaks of equality. The pastor is no equal or no greater than anybody else. And uh, we talked about this last night a little bit as well. The, 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 the pastor is like, a, you see... Sheep, shepherds around the world, uh, they do things differently. So in Israel, they actually do things a whole lot differently than every other shepherd, where the shepherds actually, like here in the, the States, we actually drive our sheep. We, we're behind them, and we have like uh, sheep dogs, and we have all this, and then we make them go certain places. But in Israel, there's actually the, the shepherds, and I forget the name of the, this, the, the way they do it, the, the names of these shepherds, but they go in front of the sheep and the sheep go behind them and there's one sheep behind them always that just follows them behind them and this sheep has like a bell on them or something that makes some kind of noise where all the other sheep are following this one sheep and this one sheep's job and, and, and whole purpose in life is just to point to the shepherd and that's what John the Baptist did he pointed to the shepherd and that's what pastors do this is what we do we say have you read the word yet? <laughs> you come up to me and you're like, what do I do? Well, the Bible says this. That's, that's what I do, right? You guys come to me and I'm like, wow, this is what you should do, right? You should do this. No, 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 no. I'm going to tell you this is what the Bible says. Because that's my job. That's my life. That's my purpose. That's what I do. All I do is point to the Lord and point you to, well, have you prayed about it yet? And you're like, uh, I don't know. Well, you should pray about it. Have you read the word yet? No. I'm called to encourage you to get in the word of God. So get that. The, the sheep is still a sheep, right? It's still dumb. The rest of the sheep will follow you down the, the cliff if you go down the cliff. So uh, lastly, look at verse 2 again. Uh, it's talking about that you should not shepherd the flock in constraint. Don't, don't be uh, legalistic with the sheep, right? You should be, the, when the sheep want to come to church, they should come naturally. They should do things naturally in ministry. I will never come up to you and say, hey, I want you to do this position in the church. Why? Because if I call you to do it, you'll do it out of pressure. And later on, you're going to be doing this. Right? You're going to be complaining and murmuring and you're going to be tired and weary and burdened and broken. But if you the, hear from the Lord and God calls you to a ministry to a, an area in the church and you just start doing it, you're already doing that ministry. You already have that title. I won't do it. If you are that person and you're a burden and you're in ministry, stop and get out of it. Don't be in it. We don't want you in it because you're going to make us all burdened. You guys with me on that? You need to come to the Lord naturally, and that's how it should be. You see, if you feel like that, don't do it. 
Uh, second thing, not for dishonest gain, but eagerly. If you are going to enter into ministry, make sure you don't do it for money. If you guys want to be a pastor, pastors don't make money, by the way. <laughs> Unless you're like some TBN guy, right, on TV and asking for money all the time. You're probably a rich millionaire. But you pastors don't make money. You're, you can't be in it for the money. That shouldn't be your motive. If it is, if it is you're not really called to ministry. <laughs> Uh, it's the wrong place for you. Um, third thing, verse 3, it says, uh, Nor as being lords over those entrusted to you, but being examples to the flock, so don't lord it over them. Some pastors say it's my way or the highway. By the way, um, I don't know if you guys have heard of the cool church here in Tucson, but there was a pastor that came to the guy, the pastor, uh, the main pastor, and he, was, he told him something, you know, how come you don't do this? The Bible says this. And the, the, the cool church pastor said, well, what, what job do you do during the week? And he was like, I'm a contractor. And he's like, do I tell you how to do your job? And he's like, no. And he's like, well, then don't tell me how to do my job. You know? And that guy actually got out. He's like, okay, I'm done with this. You know, I'm not going to serve you at this church. And he got out. But pastors aren't to do that. It's not their way or the highway. If it is the highway, you get the highway. He goes with me on that. You don't, you don't do what the pastor says. You do what the Word says. And that's why I challenge you guys. Don't listen to me, but rather challenge what I tell you to the Word of God and make sure it's God's Word. If you don't do that, you're like the dumb sheep at the end of the, the herd. You guys with me on that? Make sure it's coming from the Word of God. Otherwise, you're coming to church for nothing. Why would you even be a Christian unless you're going to hear from God? You're playing a game, and it's worthless, and you're going to waste valuable years of your life that God can be working on and doing an impact in your life for the rest of your life if you just listen to him. So be an example to the flock is to the pastor. Some shepherds drive the flock, which is not they're not supposed to do. And last, I'll just end with this. The final thing is the reason behind the exhortation, and, and that's in verse 4. It says, And when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. The crown of glory. You'll receive eternal life. Jesus Christ is coming back for his sheep. Hey, Jesus is the good shepherd who dies. Uh, John 10, 11 says the good shepherd lays down his life for the sheep. Jesus is the great shepherd who is raised. And Hebrews 13, 20 says, Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep. And also Jesus is the shepherd, uh, the chief shepherd, who will come again. Uh, 1 Peter 5, 4 right here says, When the chief shepherd appears, speaking of his uh, coming back for us. So, you guys, wherever you guys are in your walk with the Lord, you guys can apply this to your heart. You guys can appreciate the reward in the end. May your reward not be a crown of glory. Like the Bible says, a crown of glory. Yes, that is your reward. Um, but really think about it. Is Jesus your reward? Is he your crown of glory? If you're not doing things onto the Lord, you're doing things with the wrong motive. Because when you get to heaven, if you're doing things for a mansion, or you guys with me on that, it's not about being the richest and the greatest. It's about being the least and being whoever God wants you to be is the purpose, the place that you want to be in. So uh, your life is always leading somebody in some way. Uh, and may you guys point to Jesus in whatever area you are leading in. Make sure they know that you're living for the Lord in what you do. Otherwise... Um, you're in trouble. <laughs> so let's pray. Uh, Father, thank you so much for your word. There's so much here, Lord, and it's jam-packed. And uh, Lord, there's uh, just so much, that I, just so little time. And uh, we ask, God, that you would continue to minister to our hearts throughout the week, Lord, not just to be ministered to you by here uh, when we come to church, but rather you know, when we go home, Lord, when we open up your scriptures, when we come to you in prayer, Lord, may you continue to speak to our hearts May you direct us in the ways that we should go. May we be careful, Father, from the churches uh, that are out there that would be legalistic and in, in, in that way, Father, of lording it over the sheep and, and taking it for their own advantage, for their own gain. Uh, Lord, we pray that you protect us, that you would wash over us, that you would lead us, Lord, and guide us, and that you would not drive us, that you would not come to us in wrath, that you would not punish us in that way, but rather uh, discipline us, Lord, in love, Grant us your grace, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.